Hi, this is Ben Lowell of Back to the Bible Canada. I hope you've been enjoying Dr. John Newfeld's series, The Time of Your Life, this week. Join Dr. Newfeld in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 to 16 today, as he talks about the Christian pilgrim. Today's message will focus on how seeing life as a pilgrimage ties into the idea of making the very best of our time. Open your Bibles now to Hebrews 11, and let's join Dr. John Newfeld. I'm reading from Hebrews 11, 13 to 16. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of the land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. You know, we've been talking about how to use time wisely, making the best use of the days for their evil. Uh, We notice that if you're going to use your time well, you need to see yourself as on a journey, a walk. You need to see yourself progressing toward a goal. And interestingly enough, not only does Ephesians speak that way, so does the book of Hebrews. You know, many people have entitled Hebrews 11 as the Heroes Hall of Faith. Now, here's a list of uh, people who live their lives in such a way that has a great deal to teach us. They are people who are worthy heroes. Now, I want to say something. I think everyone needs heroes. I especially am saddened in our day in which so many sexual and moral scandals have occurred so that there is a rising in our culture, a sense of mistrust of everyone. And we have almost no one left to believe in. We've become a nation of cynics. I mean, how many people now delight in only tearing others down to prove that role models are an illusion? But I think the book of Hebrews has an antidote to that way of thinking. And so at the beginning of Hebrews 11, the writer of Hebrews speaks about Abel, of Enoch, of Noah, and of Abraham and Sarah. And he concludes about these five outstanding people that the way they live their lives is that they thought of themselves as pilgrims and strangers on the earth. Now, what I want to do today is to attach the idea of seeing life as a pilgrimage to the idea of making the best use of our time. Now, I say this because for many people, the idea of time passing is seen as a threat, and, and perhaps you're one of those people. You may have found this a difficult set of programs to listen to because realizing what a rare commodity time is fills you with a sense of of dread of the inevitability of your own death. That death like an eagle in the sky is hunting its prey and it's not something that you wish to dwell on. And yet the Bible speaks of the importance of being fully aware that our days on earth are growing ever shorter. Moses said, and I'm reading from Psalm 90 verse 12, he said, so teach us to number our days so that we may get a heart of wisdom. Recognizing that precious time is slipping away need not lead to fear, but it can lead to wisdom. Okay, and that's fine and well, but, but here's what I wish to do with this next point, that numbering our days, using our time well, should be connected with the idea of pilgrimage, which is what the book of Hebrews is really teaching us. I, I'm completely aware that we rarely use the word pilgrim today. I know it sounds somewhat old-fashioned, something like, I don't know whether some of you remember those old Western movies that had John Wayne in it, the black and white ones, and he'd say things like, well, pilgrim, I mean, that kind of stuff. And maybe that's your only um, encounter with a word pilgrim. But a pilgrim is a traveler, someone who's on a journey from one location to another. You know, in our day of air travel, we no longer have pilgrims. But in the olden days, when the world was still large, when so many places had yet been undiscovered, a pilgrim would be on a journey to some faraway place, a place that might take him many years to get to, and also he might expect never to get back to where he came from. And on the way, this pilgrim would encounter strange cultures and and unexpected adventures, life-threatening dangers, the possibility of, of running out of resources. It was a wild adventure that only the most brave and daring of people would ever dare to undertake. And I like the image of a pilgrim because if you really think about it, 
That's what all of us are. We really are pilgrims. None of us is remaining on earth forever. So think about your life and the time that you have as a journey to some far off place. And of course, we already know what that place is. It's called heaven. It's the eternal dwelling place of God. That is where we're going. Now, for some, you can hardly imagine that because you think you're not going anywhere. You know, you have a job, you have kids, or maybe you're off to school or something like that. And you think about your present life as a series of plans that you make and intend to keep. And you have a schedule which makes the days of your life seem remarkably predictable and hardly like some grand journey to a beautiful country you've never seen. Whenever we think of our lives as a series of stable plans in which nothing too exciting happens, here's the danger. The danger is that we'll see ourselves not as pilgrims, but as settlers. Let me explain the difference. A settler belongs to the country they live in, and a pilgrim is only passing through. A settler puts down roots, feels comfortable, is vulnerable to anything that might threaten the kind of existence they've become comfortable with. And whenever we think that way, time becomes the great enemy. For with every passing year, our settlement here on earth, with its comforts and its rewards, becomes increasingly threatened. See, my joy today is to get you to reorient that way of thinking. I want you to imagine your life and yourself as being on pilgrimage. Hebrews 11.6 or 11.16 says of the heroes of faith, but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. So, according to Hebrews, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, these people were not content with the country they lived in. That is, the first step in getting to a pilgrim mindset is this discontentment with the country that you have. Now, a lot of people are not content with their circumstances. I mean, there's absolutely nothing unusual about that. But instead of simply grouching about it, having a gab fest about everything that's wrong in the world, I don't know if you've ever done that, I have, and then you add to that what you do if you were anointed king of the earth and had the power to make any decision you wanted, wow, we would really cure all the problems. I know we've all had those gab fests, but instead of just grouching, these people in Hebrews went on pilgrimage. They were on their way to a better country. Now, that's not an unfamiliar image. I mean, Canada is a country of immigrants. I mean, my own parents were refugees. They arrived on Canada's shores after they had experienced persecution and death. My grandfather was tortured to death in the former Soviet Union. My parents went on a daring adventure in which they walked the breadth of Europe in the time of war. And some of you listening to me know that story, and others of you are new immigrants who have your own story. Well, that's the image. We're journeying to a new land, a better one, but this better one is called heaven. And if you haven't heard the news yet, heaven is real and physical. In heaven, we will have real physical resurrection bodies. There will be sights and there will be sounds and there will be smells. Heaven has cities. It has a system of government. It has established patterns of relationships between human beings. And it has laws, but of course, there's no law breaking in heaven. There is only satisfaction. I mean, that's how the Bible describes it. Heaven is all we pilgrims have ever longed for. And it's more than that. We will see God. And all the desire we've ever had, I mean the desire to fall on our faces before him who lives forever and ever, that will be fulfilled in an instant. Our lives are on pilgrimage to a different country, and we have read the travel brochure. It's called the Bible. And we loved what we read, and therefore, we are not attached to this world. Remember the old Negro spiritual? The Negro saying, this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. And that doesn't mean we can't enjoy this world or enjoy plans for the future or invest in things around us. But it does mean that we begin to judge the reality of this world in proper perspective. I mean, think again of the pilgrim. I mean, he or she might be traveling through a beautiful country or he or she might be traveling through a barren country. But the pilgrim knows he or she is traveling through He or she is not staying because they're not a settler. The joy of the pilgrim is that the country that he or she now occupies is not the one that they want to occupy. They're traveling to a different one. 
See, I've encouraged you to think about this way of all that you have or hope to have or experience in the world or fail to experience. Don't take your disappointment so seriously. You weren't going to root down in this country anyway. And this is world that we now live in is dying. It's a world of sin and death. It's a place where Satan rages. This is a place of great spiritual battle. This is not our home. As followers of Jesus, it's important that we don't become attached to the ways of the world. Our world constantly tries to tell us that we can find pleasure in money, sex, food, and our earthly possessions. The Bible tells us otherwise. The time we have on this earth is short. Seek the times that matter the most. Thanks for listening today. Are you looking for new ways to stay connected to the ministries of Back to the Bible Canada? Well, join us after the program to find out all of the ways you can connect with us today. And to find out more, you can always give us a call right now at 1-800-663-2425 or visit us online at backtothebible.ca. Now let's rejoin Dr. Newfeld as we continue our study on the Christian pilgrim. When it comes to pilgrimage, I, I love what C.S. Lewis said in this regard. He said, do not seek earthly pleasures, for there are only heavenly pleasures. Earth, he said, has no lasting pleasure to give. I mean, you've got to make that your mindset. After all, it's because you are so discontented with this life, with this land, with this culture, with this country. It's because of this. That's why you're on pilgrimage. Or think of the words of the Apostle Paul. In 1 Corinthians 7, 29, he says, This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. And of course, in that passage, he means that the day of the Lord is at hand. Soon Christ will, in fact, return. Soon the old order of things will be rolled up like a scroll, and the world and all its elements will be dissolved. Soon we're going to reach our destination. I mean, how long is that going to be? Well, not long, I think. And because of that, we're not attached to this world. And that's the first step in the Pilgrim Highway. This world is not our home. That's why that old Negro spiritual had it right. I'm only passing through. So let's look at the next reason why we're on pilgrimage. We should seek heaven by traveling its roadway. Now, it's so significant to say this. All roads do not lead to heaven. Jesus said there is a broad road that leads to destruction. But only the narrow road leads to heaven. The pathway to heaven is the pathway of faith. That's what Hebrews 11 is all about. We trust Christ. We learn to trust in his cross and not in our own righteousness and in the promises that God has made towards us. We make decisions now based on what God has promised us. All of our life, including our use of time, is based on trust. It's based upon faith. Now listen, for instance, how Abel traveled that roadway. In Hebrews 11, verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So Abel was concerned that his offering, the thing that he offered to God, unlike his brother Cain, was to be offered as the very best of what he had. I think the difference between Cain and Abel's offering is not that one was a blood sacrifice and the other was not. I think the real difference is that when Abel offered his offering, he offered the best. And when Cain offered his offering, he offered only what was left over. And so Abel offers everything that he has in faith. And Noah, pathway of faith, is described in Hebrews eleven seven. It says, by faith, Noah being warned of God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness by faith. And again, we see what Noah does. First, he believes God. He believes when God says that the world around him is destined to destruction. And because he believes, he builds an ark. And the ark that he builds both saves himself and condemns the world. He won't travel the pathway of attachment to this world because he knows this world is coming to an end and he wants another one. He wants heaven. And so every day he's building a program that, that proclaims that he's on pilgrimage. He believes the world is transitory. 
For Abraham and Sarah, the pathway to heaven meant leaving their home, traveling to a land they would later receive. And so what does it mean for us to travel the highway to heaven? How do we fit into this story? Part of the answer is found in Hebrews 12.1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now I wonder, have you ever been driving your car on an unfamiliar road and you say, I wonder if I'm on the right road? And so you look for road signs and they're going to tell you. And according to Hebrews 12 verse 1, there are in fact three road signs on the highway that leads to heaven. And if you're not seeing these signs, you are definitely on the wrong road. Here's the first of them. The highway to heaven demands that we travel light. We've got to lay aside every weight. Now that has to do with the earth's attachments. You have to lose your love for the things that are passing away. Let me get practical. How much money do you spend on the things that pass away? How much money do you spend on things that are eternal? I mean, here's an example. I imagine most of us by now have a big screen television in our house, and I don't know how much you paid for yours. And I'm not arguing it's wrong to do that. I mean, please don't think, you know, you're tuning into some legalistic mumbo jumbo about something. But there is a question in all the money that we spend on entertainment. Would you be prepared to put in as much money into ministry, into your local church, and in the ministry of gospel proclamation, like this program, would you be prepared to put as much into it as you put into that which entertains you? See, I think some of us spend all that we have on this world and next to nothing on the next, and we are traveling heavy. We say, ah, well, all the church wants is my money. Let me ask you a question. You ever walked into a store that sells clothes or computers or food? Or, I don't care what it sells and say, ha, all these people ever want is my money. I mean, look at it. Every dress in this whole store has a price tag attached to it. That's just shameless. <laughs> you know, we never say that about retail. And why do we take such exception at losing our money and possessions for the sake of the kingdom? You see, if you take exception, that's a warning sign. You're on the wrong road. You're traveling heavy. All your investments are in this world. You're acting like a settler, not like a pilgrim. You, you should be on the roadway to the celestial city. You're on the wrong road. Here's the second road sign. Put aside all the sin that clings. See, the highway to heaven is a highway of holiness. So let me ask you, what are the sins that are clinging to you? What are the ones you particularly love? I mean, maybe for you it's lust, or maybe it's power. And by the way, have you ever noticed that lust is the great trap of young men and power is the great trap of old men? I mean, power that's an aphrodisiac to old men. For them, it's a way better than anything else they could have imagined. Or maybe for you it's riches, or maybe it's the dream of fame, or, or maybe it's self-indulgence, or maybe, well, you fill in the blank. See, tell Jesus, Jesus, I love this sin, but I want you to take it from me. I want you to make me hate it so that I will abandon it. I want to learn from you to hate every form of idolatry and find in you, Jesus, and in you alone my treasure chest of joy. That's the second road sign. That's how you can tell which road that you're on. I challenge you to do that. So two road signs that you're on the wrong road. You're traveling heavy, and you need to put aside the sin that clings so closely. Here's the third road sign. Run with endurance. You know, I was a long distance runner when I was in high school. I was horrible at 100 meters. I always came in dead last, but put me on a 10K run. I just might beat you. And here's what I learned about running long races. It does require endurance. It requires ignoring all the burning lungs and burning muscles, and, and you simply will yourself forward. It means fighting through those times in, in the middle of a race in which you wonder whether or not you're going to get through. It means going for the goal. It means a long obedience in the same direction. And you can't be a pilgrim unless you determine never to quit your journey until you get there. So seek heaven by traveling its roadway. You see, we should spend our whole life traveling the roadway to heaven. That should be the great project of a life. It's not an add-on. See, some people read their Bibles in a spotty fashion. They show up church, they are irregular, they get involved in ministry, maybe they don't. They pray occasionally, they get back to the journey, and then it's kind of in fits and starts all of the time. 
it's like they're an occasional tourist to spiritual things, not a, a pilgrim, not a hardened traveler, not someone who's left home expecting never to come back. All concerns of life should be subordinate to this pilgrim life that we're on. I'm gonna add with a word from Jonathan Edwards. He said, thus we should eat and drink and clothe ourselves and improve our conversation and enjoy our friends. And whatever business we're setting about, whatever designs we're engaging in, we should inquire of ourselves whether this business or this undertaking will forward us into our way of heaven. And if not, we should quit that design. Let that be your prayer. John, this is a great message and one that really challenges my own heart, uh, the idea of being a pilgrim and, and being on that narrow road. And, uh, and I got to tell you, it, it, it's, it really is a long distance run, isn't it? It's not always romantic. It's not always adventurous. It's not, it can be just tough. So how do I keep up the stamina to be this long distance runner? Well, I think there's probably two ways of answering that. Um, one is simply from the book of Hebrews. There are presented in Hebrews 11 this hero's hall of faith. You know, you, you take courage and encouragement from those who have run the race before us. And I think practically as well, I think all of us need role models that teach us how to do this. Uh, so we need uh, mentors in our own lives to help us through this kind of stuff. A and the other is to obviously confess that we don't have the power to do that. We don't have the stamina. But the Holy Spirit is this amazing comforter who encourages us on. And so I am trusting in his power as well to keep on. Yeah. And let's just go back to that whole mentor thing. You really do need a co journeyers, is that the right word? You need somebody to come along with you. What's your experience of that? I know you've been a mentor and you are a mentor. What are some of the important components to that to help someone move along in this journey? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think, first of all, is this, is this commitment that each one of us has in our lives that we're never going to live the Christian life alone. It is only going to be lived in fellowship with others, and we need to understand fellowship as that encouraging of each other on. I mean, we've all been to church where we think fellowship is having coffee after a service and, and maybe talking about something else that has nothing to do with our relationship to God. But I think fellowship rightly understood is this encouragement that says, you know, Ben, how are you doing in your life? And you asking me, how am I doing? And we get honest in our relationship with each other. I think on a very practical level, that's where all mentorship begins. It's this transparency that we have between one another of how we're doing. Thanks, John. It really is a journey. It's a pilgrimage, but we're not alone. We have brothers and sisters in Christ, and more importantly, we have the Lord by our side. We look forward to what you have to share with us tomorrow as we conclude this series, The Time of Your Life. Are you living your life as a pilgrim, seeking a life, a journey that will lead you forward to heaven? All that we do in our lives should represent our pilgrimage with the Lord. Think about that as we close today. If there are areas in your life where you're struggling to glorify God with your time, seek Him and ask Him to help you. Tomorrow, Dr. Neufeld will be wrapping up his series, The Time of Your Life, by talking about why the Christian life should be thought of as a pilgrimage. We hope you'll join us tomorrow for more of Back to the Bible Canada. At Back to the Bible Canada, we like to stay in touch with our listeners. That's why you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Search for us on Facebook under Back to the Bible Canada. Then like our page. Our page is filled with scriptures, pictures, and more. If you tweet, look us up on Twitter by searching for at BTTBC. It's our hope that through the world of social media, we'll engage even more people in relationship with Jesus and connect them to His Word. And you can always give us a call at 1-800-663-2425 or visit us online at backtothebible.ca. Back to the Bible Canada, leading you forward in your walk with Jesus every day.